Okay, so uh, no, this is small enough that I probably don't need this, but since they're recording this, I'm gonna, we're going to use the microphones, so uh, hopefully it won't be too annoying. Um, thanks for coming to our uh, presentation. Normally this is actually an hour and a half presentation, but we'll do our best to cut it down to the 45 minutes, so I'm probably going to rip through it. If I'm going too fast, just kind of tell me to slow down. We are right before lunch, so if we go a little bit over, you know, and you guys enjoy it, we can slow down, so it's kind of up to you. Um, so um, this, uh, this is all about how we utilized Apache open source uh, in the government of Ecuador uh, to help build out their main systems. And it basically shows how we can use the Apache um, stacks to uh, build a very scalable uh, open source solution for them, a solution such that uh, it's something that we wish we could even have here in the United States. Real quickly, so you kind of know who I am. My name is Jeff Ganender. I'm the founder of and CTO of Savoir Technologies. Authored a couple of books, uh, and I'm on several Apache projects. Uh, typically, you know, we talk about what's this geek do and that sort of stuff. And you, you can read all here. I won't go into it. But uh, sometimes I like to say one of the cool things I do in my hobby is I'm a firefighter for my for my uh, community up here in Evergreen, about 40 miles west of Denver. Mr. Johan. He lives uh, about 20 miles east of me. Uh, he's a SO architect, and he's one of my top lieutenants. Um, he is uh, also a book author. I should put up his second book, which is supposed to be coming out in the near third. future. Third, his third book. I gotta, I've got to update this slide. Um, he's a patchy committer on uh, Service Mix and Camel and the PMCs on those two. And what's the non-geek thing he likes? He's a foodie great chef, and he's a sous vide cook. He has a great Google Plus. Follow him if you're interested in that. Some of his creation is just amazing, such that he actually got a job offer from his Google Plus stuff to be a chef at a Seattle restaurant, was it? So, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing how uh, geekdom can move into analyzing code. Uh, analyzing food. Going into uh, uh, basically where we're going is all the way down to Ecuador, South America. Ecuador basically, uh, it's got 16 million people. Its currency is based on the dollar and it's a democratic nation. Um, so it's kind of nice when you go there because you don't have to worry about uh, ch exchange rates when you're from the U.S. It works really nicely. Uh, the two biggest cities are Quito and Guayaquil. Guayaquil is probably the largest of the cities uh, and is down near the coast. Quito is up um, in the mountains. It's at, uh, at or around 10,000 feet, um, so it's really tough to go running there. Um, one of the things about Quito is they're not too different from the United States, where they have many different types of organizations that hold different types of data within uh, their country. Uh, for example, they have police um, stuff, police information, tax information, um, uh, company registration, that sort of thing. So they have a whole bunch of different types of, of groups, kind of similar to Social Security Administration, um, the IRS, that sort of thing. So they have all these little companies or groups, organizations that pretty much are their own little silos, just like the United States. So one of the things that they, they, they were interested in doing was putting together something called Dato Seguro. Anyone here speak Spanish? What's Dato Seguro mean? Secure Correct. Secure data. Yes, that's correct. So what they want to do is produce a system based on secure data. Everything they do there is based on what's called the concept of a cedula. So here in the United States, we have this concept of what is called um, social security number, which is very similar. Basically, you get this number, just like Mr. Assange has. Come on, guys. This was good. Come on. You're a tough crowd. Um, Basically, that little number there is the cedula number. It's like a social security number. What that does is that allows you to go out and get bank accounts. It allows you to get a driver's license. It basically makes what you are considered a taxpayer within the government of Ecuador. It's your identifier that says who you are, what you are, and uh, what, you, what you can do. So what is the goal of Dato Segura? Basically, it's to take all of these organizations, all of these government entities within Ecuador, and essentially put them on the web so the citizens, or the ciudadanos, as they call them, um, can access all this information through some form of a web portal. So some of the history of what happened here was Rafael Correa, who is the president of Ecuador back in 2007, came out and said, that's it. 
it's time for us to start using open source. And what he basically says, we will be producers of technology, not as simple consumers. We'll be the owners of the source codes, and we can develop many products that can, with cooperation of this effort, can be very useful to public and private companies in the region. For that, everyone must use free software. The Ecuadorian government has already established this as a governmental and state policy. This will be an important step in the integration, and why not say, for the liberation of Latin America. He went out, he actually had videos, it was on TV, um, and that YouTube video is actually out there where he, he makes this claim for what he wants to do. So what they did was they ended up building a system called datoseguro.gov.ec, which essentially was a uh, which essentially was a big web portal. Um, the question really became, do you trust open source? Well, basically nobody got fired for buying Microsoft, and that's what things ended up coming to. So what did they build in their version 1.0? They built essentially. SOAP web services uh, built around a web.net. It was a big Microsoft engine um, that, um, that connected all these different entities together, pretty much point to point. So what were the problems? Problemas? Um, well, first of all, there's the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room was, wait a second, why are they continually buying open, um, they, they said they're gonna go to open source, yet they're buying Microsoft and Oracle and all this other stuff and paying large amounts of money. And so that gave that led on to licensing or licensing. And they were spending gobs of money on the Microsoft engines and that sort of stuff. Also, uh, it was extremely insecure, uh, inseguridad. Uh, and basically, uh, back in December 2012, uh, Citizen was arrested for uh, hacking into the data security. Essentially what this guy did was, it's a 42 year old guy who basically took the president's schedule, he was able to find it, went and signed up and got all of his information. Um, and so they picked him up and threw him in jail for about six months and the president finally pardoned him and said no, I want, I want this information to get out there because this tells us that we have problems, we need to, we need to work on this. The architecture was one of the major problems that they had. Basically, it was a web portal, .NET, uh, talking point to point to all these different SOAP web services. So basically, since it was point to point, there was no message guarantee. There were no failover capabilities. In other words, uh, the infrastructure inside of Ecuador is extremely unstable. They have good internet, but their servers would go down, their data centers would go down all the time. That caused a lot of problems. Um, it's not modular. Um, there was no way to just randomly deploy and, and bring up systems as it needed to be. So what they needed basically was a scalable solution. They actually said this time around we're going to go with open source. As far as Microsoft is concerned, that's it. Goodbye. Have a, have a good night. We're not going to start using that. Um, can continue to use that. And Java, they started to look at Java. They said, you know, it seems the world's companies, financial institutions, governments, the United States government, their, their internal systems are running on Java. Um, so they wanted to look at Apache service mix. And the nice thing about service mix is it's an enterprise service bus. Basically within service mix, they utilize Carafe. Um, and it was, it was basically they wanted to handle modular deployments through OSGI. They wanted to be able to handle division of labor. In other words, being able to take different um, um, servers or implementations of Caraf and be able to deploy parts of different con uh, competing consumers so they could do a division of labor, saying this server is just for reading web service data and this service is for um, doing stuff with Cassandra. ActiveMQ. Um, they leverage for guaranteed messaging. No more would they want to be losing messages and things going into the never never land. Um, that gives them the persistent messaging. If things go down for some reason, they're able to bring the servers back up and continue processing um, from where they left off. And it basically allows for event and consumer based polar. And what that really does is that removes the point to point. An Apache Camel was used for basically data and communication routing of their data. Uh, it was used for data transformation, changing the data from one state to another, uh, pulling information out of databases, storing them into databases, and routing the data through uh, ActiveMQ.
And it basically acted as an endpoint container. It would be what we do to deploy our web services and JAXRS in order to communicate with the outside world as well as endpoints to communicate with ActiveMQ. And we'll get into the tech of that in a little bit. We use Apache CXF was the web service container uh, leveraged with in, in accordance with CAMEL. We use SOAP and JAXWS for external communication and JAXRS for internal ESB communication. And then we used uh, Apache Cassandra as well. It's uh, fault tolerant data and we used it as a cache for service queries as a backup. And you'll kind of take a look when we show you the architecture, what we did, you'll say, wait a minute, why aren't you using that uh, basically purely as a cache? Um, you know, why are you going to the services all the time? Why would you just pull the data out of that? And that had to do with political information. Well, we'll show you what we did. Uh, and it had to do with the in infrastructure being really not in good, not in good shape. But from political reasons, they wanted every endpoint to hit the, the end service before hitting the cache. The cache was actually a backup if that service was down. So the solution, what was the solution that we came up with? Well, there, in order to do business down in, um, in Latin America or in Ecuador, a U.S. company just can't walk in and start doing business. You have to team up with another company. So this company called Latinus, uh, which is a consulting company down there, teamed up with us. And um, we were contacted to do help do um, a software for Dirección Nacional de Registro de Datos Públicos, and that would be DINRDAP for short. DINRDAP is the controlling entity that oversees all those different organizations to create a single backbone to access the data. The name of the system we ended up building was SINRDAP, Sistema Nacional de Datos Públicos, and that was the whole backbone. That was going to be the actual system. So our system really was three tiers. We had the web tier, we had a routing tier, which was what they called the ESB, and then we also had the adapter tier, which is also ESB, but those were the components that lived out very close to the organization where the data lived. And what would happen is the web tier would communicate with the ESB tier, ESB tier would communicate and act as a hub or in a hub and spoke type of configuration to communicate with all of the, the adapters, all the different organizations. And it was, and we'll, we'll this is the 100,000 foot view, so we'll, we'll, we'll go we'll dig deeper. So the first thing is the web tier, they chose LifeRay kind of as a portal to be, to put all these different these government entities together as a one-stop shop. And it, it basically was the front end uh, where clients would access, they'd register, um, they'd do the registration of their cedulas uh, for the data access, and it was, it was the direct point for where the end user accesses all of the, its information. So essentially what it looked like was the client would communicate via HTTP through an HTTPD server, and it would, that, that would communicate via AJP or mod proxy AJP to the LifeRay containers. LifeRay containers utilized LDAP, actually open LDAP, as, um, as its security mechanism to be able to register and, and look up um, the, the citizens. And then this, this part would, would, at this point, we're on the other side of, we're kind of on the ESB side, where we would communicate utilizing JAXRS um, with using CXF clients and JSON to the routing side, which is the ESB. Um, a lot of people look at this and they say, okay, so how did you implement that? I like that. You know, tell me a little bit. How did you implement that? What does that really look like? So I, I kind of like to show how it, what it kind of looked like. Um, so we had load balancers using HTTP, um, and, it, and we had a set of Apache HTTPD servers uh, that were split up between data centers. And those, each data center would do their own set of session clustering. So the failovers would be doing fine as long as it was within the same data center. If a data center dropped, then you'd lose your session. You'd have to go fa fail over to another data center. That was rare. Um, it, you know, at worst case, you'd, you'd lose an Apache within a data center, and this was their strong data centers. 
Um, and the session clustering was done to LifeRay, and that would communicate via, uh, that those LifeRay would communicate via JAXRS to the route side. One of the things, actually I should go back, uh, one of the nice things that we used with CXF, they, they originally tried using Metro, but one of the nice things about CXF is the JAXRS stack, in, client stack inside of, um, inside of uh, CXF has the ability to be able to fail over, which is really nice. Um, and um, the, the other stuff that's out there, reference implementations, they can't do that, at least not as e easily and not as elegantly. And that was one of the things they wanted to do, was be able to fail over from one data center to another for the service mix containers or carafe containers. Um, that was really critical. So CXF came to the rescue for that. Um, the, uh, then we have what we call the route tier. They called it the ESB tier. It was kind of what did all the, the engine, so to speak. And it was basically the main conduit for handling requests and mediation between the web tier and the external system adapter. So it, it was really the mediator. It was the meat of the ESBs. And it was really what handled all the guaranteed message and the data caching. So what this looked like, we'll bring it down to the 50,000 foot level, is the web would, would speak JAXRS, as we saw on that other slide, and it would contact our endpoints on service mix. And it was made up of several different service mixes put together, and it was done for division of labor. Certain, we would have certain serv service mix engines communicate um, you know, have a certain type of thing that it's very good at doing. It would maybe handle certain types of JAXRS calls. It would handle some certain types of routing. Therefore, we're able to just bring up and spin up act, um, uh, service mix containers as the load needed it. Um, these service mix containers basically would communicate, would, would utilize um, ActiveMQ for guaranteed messaging, and we had what's called a network of brokers in there that allowed for uh, that, that if something failed, um, we were able to fail over either to a slave or we were able to have high scalability of this network of brokers making several different active MQs work together as a single unit. Really allows for high scalability. Um, we also use Cassandra basically as our data cache, and I'll show you how all that stuff works in a few minutes. Um, and then that, that would communicate with the adapters on the backside. The adapter tier, these were the adapters. These basically lived near the government service locations. The government services were all over the place. They could be uh, in Guayaquil, they'd be in Quito, they could be in many small towns. Believe it or not, there were a few in the Galapagos. Um, and um, I, I tried to get on that gig, but uh, unfortunately I was shot down. But you, you know how that goes. Uh, I don't think I'd get very much work done there too. Uh, these are basically the endpoints that we'll take, and this is Ron, it's actually Jack's WS requests uh, for, the, for the government services. And um, it basically would be also the proxies to their backend's data services. So we translate all of their backend web services that were non-compliant, our old Microsoft SOAP 1.x RPC, which um, Jack's WS won't even work with. Uh, I mean, um, we, we, had, we had everything from Sybase to uh, XML RPC. Oh yeah, you, it was terrible. It. Absolutely terrible. And this is kind of what that looked like. What that looked like was the route side would communicate via JAXWS, and the reason why we used JAXWS is we had contracts. We had to have very solid contracts because they also wanted to allow mashups um, to be able to leverage some of these services, not just to the ESB and not just to the front end, but they also wanted to leverage that for services. And Based upon the strict data rules, um, they thought having a strong contract was the way to go. So those were Jax WS. They actually did want to use Jax RS in the beginning. We actually talked them out of it and explained to them why they don't want to and showed them examples of why they didn't want to and they acquiesced. Um, basically, that goes to a service mix container that has the spe specific adapter in it, the camel adapter in it. And we used ActiveMQ in a master-slave configuration at each adapter for updates that had to go back to the data cache in the routes in case, for some reason, the network dropped. We would able to get answers back into the data cache to populate Cassandra. And we'll show you how all that stuff works in just a moment. Um, 
Uh, so we did that so we would have the guaranteed delivery. Also, when there would be updates, say, on the Oracle or Postgres or what whatnot, we'd want that data to be able to go back into um, the uh, into Cassandra. And if the network was down, we didn't want to lose that. So the message would, an update message would go into ActiveMQ, and then every 15 seconds it would wake up and say, can I push it over? Can I push it over? Is the network back up? So let's take a look at Service Mix. So with Service Mix, basically we, util we leveraged Apache Carafe. And I say Service Mix because we did what's called a bastardized Service Mix. We didn't want the full container. We wanted to build something a little lighter. So we take Apache Carafe. Uh, basically, it was our OSGI container, and that's what provided our modularity. In other words, as we put new routes and new organizations on, we could do the deployment into Service Mix without having to bring down the con container. This was a mission-critical system. We did not want to be doing bringing down containers. It just wasn't going to go well. Um, and we used Apache Camel and CXF bundles as, as our modules that we would deploy into Service Mix. So who here is familiar with Service Mix and Carafe? About half of you. So um, Service Mix is basically Apache Carafe, and it's got Apache Felix as the OSGI container in it. And what it comes with out of the box is Apache Camel, Apache CXF, Camel routes and web services inside, and then a whole host of other things as well. But this is kind of like the high-level view of what, what, what we leveraged. What it gives us is, is modularity, and the deployables... Uh, the nice thing about this is it made our deployables anywhere. We could deploy anywhere we wanted. And these would be our camel routes and our web services. What it really gave us is because it got rid of the ability to do point to point, we were able to do what's called competing consumers, which gave us magical clustering. We could instantly cluster all of our services to be able to handle multiple requests. So I could spin up additional service mix as load increased and because it's competing consumers, throwing more consumers would allow more data to flow through the system. So let's take a look at our ESB tour. We'll go from 50,000 feet down to about 10,000 feet. Basically, we're using Apache Camel as our routes. Um, we use that to mediate all of our JAX RS calls that were coming inbound from, from the web. And it ensured that the calls went through uh, even if the adapter service failure. In other words, if for some reason um, the back-end adapters failed, we're still able to handle and process the data as it goes through the system. So I'm going to let, um, I'm going to have Johan kind of jump in at this stage and kind of talk about what our routes look like. These are generic camel EIP symbols. You can download these. Uh, what we built here, uh, I don't like the term SOA, I don't like ESB, even though that's what we're consulting on. Uh, I prefer asynchronous applications because that's really what we're after. Uh, and what we had is, for the first part, we would have a request coming in. That's the web services request. They're talking to a JAX RS endpoint. They've already been authenticated, but they give us a sticky session. We can validate that uh, data check and say, are you allowed to consume this service as a client, yes or no? That way we get a decoupling where we don't have to maintain session on the ESB side. We then go uh, and wiretap this so that we have the request, we can log that, and then we go talk to a SOAP service that's remote or could be in the same data center, but we're basically sending out a request to an adapter. That adapter is our customer-facing implementation that contains legacy code, whatever was needed to get access to that data. I think we have, uh, just in JPA, seven or eight different databases we're talking to, uh, different vendors, but it's really just about pulling out the data. As soon as we get a response, we wiretap that out. We're basically making a, a copy of the response. We're shoving that into Cassandra. If we were to say time out, we will go and look in Cassandra, see if we have it. That's our caching mechanism. Ideally, if we had been able to control the infrastructure without the politics, 
we would have made a mark sweep dirty and consumed these databases, pushed it into Cassandra. That wasn't the case. So response time-wise here, we're looking at 315 milliseconds going from agency to agency. When we're doing it straight from Cassandra, we were looking at 15 milliseconds. So it's ridiculously fast when we had outages. Outages were the best thing that could happen to us. Uh, so once we tap that on the update queue, here once again, we do, we're doing this asynchronously. We don't want a synchronized write to impede on the update or the response time. So we're dumping this on a queue. We're then saying that we have an update queue. That one is a uh, pull a message, retry, write it down into Cassandra. And what we're doing here is we're writing uh, with a quorum and a replication factor of two. So we can be fairly certain that our clusters have updated across data centers until we need the next, uh, sorry, next update. And the third part, as you can see, we're repeating the same patterns over and over again. On the adapter side that is sitting out at an agency, we once again get the uh, response. Here we're talking about a SOAP request. We take that SOAP request, we modify it once it, it's coming back to what we put into Cassandra. And if we were to send an update, the adapter has the same thing. So the service agency can actually update the Cassandra cache by sending an update. If they can contact us, they have two queues where we park and rotate messages until we can get them through. So it's, it's really about just building reliable messaging, don't miss a message, and get everything through. And what we're using here is Camel. Uh, Camel came out of ActiveMQ, so it's fairly similar to what you would see in a JMS message. Uh, Camel basically turns something, a message sequence into an exchange. An exchange has an in and out, it has headers, it has properties, and it's an abstraction of how to communicate between components. On the outside of this, you will have from components, and you will have two components, and you will have processing steps. The main reason we used Camel for this is that, one, we have something that's communicatable in terms of EIP patterns. We can describe the design and we have something doing all the legwork for us in connecting components, connecting to JMS, uh, giving us web services, uh, giving us database integration if we want to. You have around uh, 180 components and data formats in Camel. And you can describe Camel routes in XML, which I personally hate, or you can do it in the Java DSL. Uh, which gives you type safety. And these are essentially our routes. This is exactly what our routes look like. So for each gov government entity, it had something that was very similar to this. So this was it. This was, th it was this easy to wire things together. And that is what kind of made what we call our, our RESTful processors. Um, that's what implemented a service pool to talk to adapters. So one of the cool things that Johan put together was this, this really neat service pool with CXF. So th there's overhead with creation of the services. Um, and we knew there'd be a lot of communication going back and forth. So we put together this service pool or a uh, pool of CXF clients, services, to be able to communicate between the RESTful uh, part and the adapter part. Um, and the cool thing is we were able to wrap into it what was called a timeout, which was if the adapter was down, um, it would reference Cassandra. So if I couldn't communicate to a government entity, I'd go into Cassandra and say, hey, here's the cedula, do I have the information, and pass back basically the same thing, the same payload. And Johan, go ahead and I can zoom in as you need. Well, can you read? Oh. So the idea here is that we made a very generic type of processor. Uh, we know that we're gonna ship a payload or we're gonna receive a payload. 
That's the SOAP services we have. Uh, when you're updating remote systems and you start queuing up a lot of stuff, uh, and you're working with flaky infrastructure, one of the key things that will happen is that as soon as that server comes back up again, if you start pounding it, there's a huge likelihood that you will bring it down again. Uh, they had, in the remote end here, WebLogic servers, and when we started queuing, so we had a few thousand requests sitting, as soon as their servers came back up, we would knock them over again. So what we did is we took uh, the generic CXF JAX-RS client, put that into a commons pool, kind of like a JDBC adapter. We created those and retained the clients as we needed them. Then we put the clients into a Java future. That future we could mark as down. We could give it conditionals. We could say, don't even try this one. Just say, I'm done, give us a null back, and we'll go look in Cassandra. That combined with two queues allowed us to say, if I'm down, this message that's coming through, just park it here. Then we'll go try in a few minutes and see if we can send one message. If we can send one message, start queuing the remaining messages with a 15 second interval. That way we could accommodate downtime, we could queue up messages, and we could guarantee message delivery. Because we're just constantly gonna loop over and over, making sure that these messages go through. And the cool thing about this was, so the first guy through, if he's down, he marks it down, and everyone behind him says, we're going to Cassandra. They won't even try. And then every 15 seconds, we'd say, okay, go ahead, you can try. One guy tries, he'll get a five second timeout. It dies, we mark it down, continue. So you're only getting one poor guy who has to get the five second pain when the infrastructure's down via the timeout, and everyone else is doing fine. So what that does is that allows the flow to go through. And as soon as that first guy can connect, then he opens it up and the floodgates can continue through. And it worked really, really well. And this is kind of the code snippet for what we used as far as, you know, if, if, if it was down, if we got a timeout exception, we would, go to, we would go to Cassandra and pick that data up out of Cassandra. Um, and it was really great. He, he really put some good stuff. And here at the very end, you can see here we're, we're checking out of the pool at the very end. We check it back in, this, the CXF client back in the pool. And that worked really nice as far as overhead was concerned. Making reuse of these clients just really worked well. Okay, so that was the ESB tier. Let's take a look now at the adapter tier. The, again, this is the tier that was close to the government um, entities. Basically, um, all the adapters in, inside of Service Mix there were uh, Apache Camel routes. Uh, each company or organization has its own service. Um, so each government entity was at their location. It was their very own service. Um, and it was close to their own data centers. It lived within the data centers of the government entity. And uh, it basically was the mediator between a JAX-WS call and the back-end company data sync. And like Johan said before, it could be anything, a Sybase, um, uh, an old Microsoft.net, some PHP stuff, SOAP RPC, all sorts of stuff. We really had to write a lot of stuff. So go ahead, Johan. Same thing here, uh, you can see the same type of pattern. So what we did here is that we got a call in, uh, that's a request reply. We started out using SATA there, we actually migrated that later to ActiveMQ, so we would have an asynchronous request reply if we had multiple adapters sitting out on the site. Depending on the size of these ones, like the police systems, uh, for some reason, people have a lot of police records. We ended up having three adapters sitting talking to the uh, Policia databases. Uh, it's interesting because everything is integrated. So we could actually, and they don't have testing data, so we could actually see our passport and entry into Ecuador when we were playing around with this data. Uh, anyways. So this comes in. We go look in the database or SOAP endpoint, or in some cases I think it was actually a flat file that they were provisioning. That's the request reply route. Then we have 
uh, once we started getting performance out of this, and they saw this, they saw the response times on Cassandra, a second project actually came about for us to start allowing updates. And that was from the remote side updating into the cache. That one became basically turn around the request we're doing, give us the same data set that we're storing in Cassandra, but provide us with an update uh, key, provide us with an update timestamp so we can compare the data and show us what the differences are. Same thing there. We get the request. That request we put on ActiveMQ directly. Then we use the same client that we were using in the ESB, uh, wrap that in a pool, put that client to listen to a queue, go see if I can contact the ESB. As soon as I can contact the ESB, I'll ship the message. If I get a 200 OK, I get everything through. We release the message. Otherwise, we put it back on a failure queue. We say this one has failed. We start polling the update. So it was really fault tolerant. It really, any time that the infrastructure was down, we would really be able to, being sure that the, uh, uh, and understanding that we would be able to push the updates back over to the ESB. The, the critical component here was the database. There was a couple of interesting things to note. We used JPA connectivity for the database. Uh, because we had so many different databases, we needed uh, rapid development and we needed rapid generics for using CRUD. So essentially, we basically used the concept of a generic DAO. I'm sure who here has used these before? Generic DAOs? A few of you? The whole nice thing about this is by putting together a generic DAO interface, it allows you to create CRUD with almost no code once you put it together. So I have an interface that has create, read, update, deletes with, um, with templates passed through. And then my implementation is called a generic JPA DAO. So in here, I, in, I inject my entity manager, and I'm able to actually do the actual calls, the EM persist, EM find. And with that, just by doing that, this is how simple it is. Basically, I, I have a DAO implementation that extends my generic DAO. Hopefully, you guys can read that. Can you guys see that? And it's real simple. Essentially, the minimum thing I need is just the constructor. That's it. Now I have full CRUD being able to go into it, into the uh, database. And what's cool is, let's assume that I wanted a specific query. Well, then I can just add it in here. I can just add the, the specific query, like get by ID, and I can actually put my own specific query. But I have basic CRUD. That allows us, allowed us to do extremely rapid development utilizing JPA to the back end database. Postgres, Oracle, Sybase, MySQL, Sybase, uh, SQL Microsoft Server, SQL, HSQL, DB. Yes. Because each entity had its own adapter to its back end, and each government entity had its own back end, and it could have been any of the above. Some so, of them were SOAP RPC services where we had to literally write the XML or use access, some old access stuff to be able to communicate with it. And that was definitely a challenge to get running in OSGI. So. So, so what we did inside of here, which isn't 100% showing, is basically we have a generic vocabulary for updates, so we have an entity model that's abstract. Whatever was at an agency, and that could be social security, it could be police, it could be health records, we treat that as legacy or what, by whatever means we'll get the data out. We convert that into our own message exchange. That is what we store. So we, we, the first two adapters probably took a week and a half to build. The last adapters we were building, uh, we actually- One or two days. <laughs> one, two days to crank finally out had a pattern, the whole thing. Factory patterns and that sort of stuff. We finally got it down to almost like a, and, an and engine. And this is really, uh, since it was a government project, I mean, I think we could have done Obamacare better. Uh, we're talking about integrating every service they had. And where we got a lot of help in the politics from Latinus was communicating, defining a contract, uh, going through what data could be processed, what was legally correct. Uh, all of this is publicly available data, but it's a data aggregation project. 
And this pattern that we just showed you, it was so successful, to two or three additional clients thereafter, we've put the same thing into place, uh, which is really cool. So. And it's, it's nothing, it's not rocket surgery, it's nothing complicated, it's asynchronous applications. Which is really the magic of making this work and scalable. Yes. <laughs> Two. We didn't do the web piece that was done by the Latinist folks. They were struggling to be able to do. That's why they even reached out to us. They were struggling with the OSGI <laughs> containers. They couldn't. Uh, so we we went in there. We single-handedly did it in about what six months. Mm -hmm. Everything. And we had we had two guys from Ecuador that were kind of doing the build, QA, and testing. And our stuff, we, we, we did test-driven development with unit tests and everything, and uh, what we found maybe one bug. It went into production and started flying, one, maybe one bug, but I, I'm, we, I'm pulling we, the punchline. We, we, <laughs> we're, we've had one bug fix on, I think I was actually setting a timestamp as a string which confused uh, things and it was stupid. That's the only update bug we, this isn't hard. This is more of a conceptual thing. Uh, the same patterns can be used to build pretty much any application. If you think about ActiveMQ, the queuing, if you've done swing application development, that's your EDT. Everything we do are just components. Uh, if you're familiar with Scala, Akka is internally working the same way. Uh, and me personally, I think any application should work this way. Because if you start relying on sequence, uh, delivery time, this and that, you're in the wrong place. Th this allows us to do updates, propagation, scaling, distribution, uh, you name it. And what we're talking about here is 16 million people. Uh, 16. 16. 16. And 15 agencies with large amounts of data. And we'll get to it, and we're close to running out of time. But you're not even talking about a lot of machines to do this. Right. So let me get into Apache Cassandra. We we used Apache Cassandra in that centerpiece. It's a NoSQL database, um, and it, it's really what allowed us to have fault-tolerant data access. It's extremely performant, and the nice thing about it is it's, uh, it's decentralized. If you lose one Apache Cassandra server, you're fine. The other ones will continue on without losing any data. It's really fantastic. What our Apache Cassandra uh, looked like in our data center was uh, the nice thing about it was we, we would have them in multiple data centers, we'd have multiple racks, and we would set that up to be able to communicate cross rack, cross data center, to move data back and forth and be sure that we had data completely failed over and put anywhere. So if they lost a rack, a, a single Cassandra server, a rack, or a full data center, we would never lose any data. Uh, we basically used it to cache the service calls. Uh, it's based on Thrift API. They're getting into CQL right now. Uh, at the time we were doing it, we utilized uh, Thrift, and it, Thrift was very uh, code intensive, even with Hector. So we needed an API that was just as easy as uh, as JPA for CRUD. We could not. I don't know who here's coded in Thrift before. Nobody got one guy. It's not. It's ugly and it's extremely. There's it, it's, a lot of code. It, it's very hard to deliver and have other people to start working on it. So one of the things is Cassandra looks like this as far as a column family is concerned. We, we get different, you got rows, keys, different columns. But if you flush out the columns, what does that look like? It looks like a Java bean. So we could probably come up with an API that maps the row and column fields in a Java bean very similar to JPA. So we took about two weeks to put together what we called um, Hecate. And it's actually out there in the open source world. If you look on GitHub under Savoir Tech and Hecate, Hecate is the goddess, the Greek goddess of black magic because it got rid of all the thrift. And essentially, you have, uh, you basically have an entity. You basically create a Java bean. You declare your indexes within it. And then we have our generic DAO, um, which not all that different, right? 
CRUD, delete, get keys, contains keys, save, find, and whatnot. And then we would have what's called an iterating DAO. In other words, Cassandra's good at sending a lot of data back. So we wanted to be able to iterate through, through um, your, your data so you could have a small memory imprint if you had to have thousands of records come back for some reason or another. So you'd have a, we would have a generic iterating DAO. And from that, we would do an abstract DAO, and it was this simple. You'd create a DAO interface, uh, which implements the, uh, extends the generic iterating DAO, and then there's your implementation right there. It's that simple. And then even for, and for the iteration, this is an example here where I set up my key space configurator. Don't worry about that. That's all Cassandra speak. Here, I just declare my DAO in setting it up. And this is really the code. Here's my iterator. Let me make it smaller. Here's my iterator where I do a find and do a lookup. And then I iterate through each of my columns. I mean, and, and it's that easy. All of a sudden, if anyone has used Thrift, it's pretty hardcore. And then this is how easy it is. The stuff in blue, this is how easy it is to use the bean, the bean mapper. Get the OSGI service, utilize the DAO. Those components in the blue are, are, is basically doing a save. It does a lookup. Uh, it does a find. It does a delete. It does a find again. Very, very little code. The last piece in all of this is ActiveMQ. We used ActiveMQ for JMS. It was a persistent messaging platform, and it removed our poise to point. Everything was consumer-based pol polling strategy. And essentially, this is what it looked like. Each one of the CAMEL clients would communicate to a, different, to, to a master slave in, in data centers. The data centers could be configured both internally and externally in a network of brokers. What that did was it allowed consumers to go from one data center to another depending upon what the failover. So this CAMEL client here on the left, if that master active MQ went down, it would fail over internally to the slave in that data center. If that entire data center went down, it could go over to the second data center and utilize the master slaves over there. Same thing with the CAMEL clients over here. In order to go either side, um, it will do a master slave in data center two and then fail over to the, to, to one of the other data centers, and it worked very well. We used the failover transport, and it allows for massive scaling, uh, and we could continually add on broker nodes and continue to scale out as, as, um, as time went on. And it allowed, between the different data centers, the messages flow freely. Um, it allows for consumer-based polling. There's no point to point. All each camel, endpoint needs to do is send into ActiveMQ and the other one reads it out. It doesn't need to know where the destination is. No point to point. And that's what allows for loosely coupling producers and consumers. And it also enabled uh, competing consumers as well. So that's pretty much what the system was. What was the result? We were able to handle over 40 million transactions per day. Actually, I think we could handle a lot more, and that was only with a handful of service mixes. That was the only thing it was tested for. Yeah. It we, was, we don't know where this is going to We fail. really think we could have done probably five or six times that. Um, it allowed for full failover, um, and we were able to process transaction while almost any endpoint server was down. There were no single points of failure in this architecture whatsoever. And the Ecuadorian government, they found this to be so successful uh, uh, that uh, they, they came out and said it was a tribute to Java and leveraging open source. They want all of their systems to go in that direction. And this system has actually become a poster child for other Latin American countries. Uh, Chile, Peru, and Colombia are now reaching out to us to examine their own internal systems to create their own initiative for this. So this has been, really been quite uh, a success. And um, it's just been, it's been fantastic down there. It's been one of the best. They said it was probably the most successful software implementations they've ever done. And the beautiful thing was it was all done on Apache open source. Um, any questions? I hope there's questions because for questions, uh, Mr. Johan is going to pass out. Um, we have a few books here. He's going to pass out uh, some books as, as gifts. <laughs> I'm sorry? Test it? The whole stack can be run in a unit test. Sorry? 
Uh, they used uh, JMeter and Traffic Generator and had, uh, I think, 30 Amazon instances going against it. We, we, we weren't allowed to filter out anything. Yes, um, quite honestly, um, when they tested, uh, it was actually with production data. They didn't give us test data. So you could, we were actually having fun with the guys uh, around there. I was like, give me your cedula. Let me see if you got a police record. It's funny, a couple of them said they wouldn't do it. Um, and then I said, well, what would happen if I put a type P here and I put my passport, my US passport in there? So I did that, and sure enough, all my exit and entries came up in the police database, so it was really kind of cool. I actually, had a, I actually had a little record in there. Uh, just quickly, um, now that you've uh, got the We mentored a uh, uh, team of developers down there. In fact, actually, the government hired one of the guys from Latinus who we, who we mentored. He's actually the manager of a team there. So we mentored them, and we put together a good um, snapshot on how to put these together. So w it got down where it was almost template-like code on, here's what you need to do. You do this, you do this, you do this. Be sure you do this. And as long as they followed those templates, um, they were able to do it and produce it. And they, they have added on a few extra services since we've left. This was actually deployed on Amazon and VM. Okay. So they had two data centers. Uh, we weren't involved in the Puppet deployment or things like that. Uh, putting this on an AMI or similar, uh, the distribution here is Maven-based. So if you have network access, deployment is that simple. Uh, traditionally, you can do this with OpenStack. You can do it with Puppet. You can do it with Chef. You can do it with JClouds. Uh, there's nothing in this design that hinders cloud. Absolutely. 100%. The, the, I, I'd say the only thing you would have to look at, what is IO intensive, like for Cassandra? Uh, do you have the IO performance you need for ActiveMQ? Our test harness was done on VMs uh, in a data center. So we were actually doing that to a certain degree. Uh, it's a trade-off because that whole uh, when, when you start arguing that Cassandra is eventually consistent, that depends on how you insert. So we are inserting, with a quorum, a replication factor of two. So technically, we are inserting correctly. And what we did with our reflection library is that we don't update column by column. So we're not really concerned about the transactionality because what we're doing is we're sweeping out a column slice right away and we're pulling in a slice, uh, you can do locking in Hector right now. You can do it in the CQL as well. Uh, but since what we're looking for is really last updated or last data I had received, we never had any transactional problems. But to the transactionality thing, what you're really looking for is that if you can write down POJOs in a graph type of way, so you put the links down as you write it, and you write the, the links, you have the right replication factor, you really don't have a consistency issue. We had no consistency issues, and we made that clear up front. They actually wanted to be able to do uh, transaction-based stuff. We said, you can't. And he, I said, if you want to use transactions, you're going to HBase. Um, you, you can't do it. I said, if you want to do you know, business 
If you want to do you know, business reporting stuff, we can do that for you. I said, but if you're going to do locks for concurrent updates, it's not going to happen. And I said, it's got to be optimistic. Based on the fact that this was done as a cache, that works. You don't need transactions. We did, and we knew that. I mean, we, the, when we went in there, said, you're not getting transactions of years in Cassandra. Now, we could have harnessed up Zookeeper and did something, and then I, then I would have looked at him and said, why don't we just go to a regular database, right? So, you know. But, but, but there's several ways you can do it. I mean, I've added to Hikati, so uh, data stack pissed me off, so I added a Lucene uh, directory for Cassandra, so we can start doing that. Normal ways is that you do external indexing. So you put an index outside. Once you've written to that index, you can say, okay, I've committed correctly to Cassandra. You get data consistency. And the whole trade-off is that whole, where it takes you 300 milliseconds to write to a JDBC database, you're talking about two, three milliseconds to push it in. It's wicked fast. Anyone else? Luke. Not sure I understand the now question. Now you lost me. No. We don't, we don't need to aggregate. We're queuing data for the writes on ActiveMQ. That's then written down. Yes. We didn't. I mean, could we have batched? We probably could have, but it, we, we're in the, we were in similar data centers. It really wasn't, it, it, they were close, so there wasn't a huge need to have to batch. Could we have? Yes. yes Did we need to? No. It had no, there was almost no impact. Because keep in mind also, it was done, if you recall the route, it was an update route on a wi wiretap. We didn't care. Once it got an active MQ and started writing, we didn't care. There was some other machine who, who would pick it up and say, oh, I've got, I've got work to do. I need to shove in Cassandra. There was no... It, it wasn't something that created dependence on I.O. time, so it really made no difference. So what we did is, uh, think a normal POJO, primitives and any, anything like that. We just use a normal serializer type infer to get the types. Complex objects, we serialize this object serializer. So they were byte arrays. Uh, this isn't a use case where you will run into wide rows or anything similar. Uh, Sorry? Time series data we had, but that we use composite column families for. So we index time series uh, separately. Yes? What about the transition from the old phrase to the much better way? Um, what do you mean? We, we, it was we, seamless. They literally hit a switch. We, we, we went in and took over. Their adapter said, give us your schema, show us how you want to do this, uh, or what we have access to. And then we pulled out the data. There we had help with the language barriers and everything else. But I think the biggest thing that helped this was that they had failed miserably once. So they were willing to listen. And what we tried to do was Remove architects, remove uh, software craftsmanships, uh, all mental masturbation, <laughs> because it was really just about pulling out the data and making this repeatable, simple, and something that if we were to address something, we address the whole stack at, in one go. No, it, it depended on the agency. Some of them had firewalls, DM sets, zones, data replication part out of this. But it was really, we treated it like a EDI or business to business case scenario because these services, these agencies benefited from making this data public. It led to 
reduction in workforce, they could do 24-7 information services. Uh, so everything is a give and take. You, you need to present them with something that they benefit from that doesn't mean that they have to do an insane amount of work. Anyone else? Nope. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.